Um, it's my pleasure now to introduce Paul Brody. Paul is a vice president and partner in IBM's Global Business Service Organization, and he leads our electronics industry uh, in terms of all of the services that we do, which is which are quite a, quite a bit. And Paul, you can see that the uh, uh, the uh, the title here, the presentation of sustaining competitiveness through business model transformation. Uh, but but really, you know, Paul, we, we've had a lot of lessons about what's going on in the you know, business to consumer marketplace. And the real question is in the business to business marketplace, you know, how can we also employ a lot of those same lessons and how can we learn uh, a little bit and, and uh, adapt those things as, uh, as we move forward. So with that, I'd like to ask Paul to come up to the stage. So thank you very much. I'm so happy to see that most of you came back from the break. <laughs> um, so I would like to start just by saying, you know, this is the most amazing group. I feel a little bit challenged. This is the most amazing group of speakers, I think, that we've ever had in the six years that I've been coming to these events. So you have all set the bar very high for me. And uh, I will try to hurdle it, but there's some risk I won't. I will say, I, I heard a couple of speakers say, they talked about IBM, and they said IBM is our trusted partner. And we, we work with them closely, and we, de we depend upon them. And when I hear that, I am so grateful and so humbled. Right? I, I, it's the highest compliment that anyone can pay to us to say that we are your trusted partner. And so, uh, I'm truly grateful for the time, your valuable time that you are spending here over these two days, and I hope that we continue to earn uh, that designation as a trusted and thoughtful partner. So what I'd like to do today is probably in the category of thoughtful. I'm known inside of IBM as somebody who is rarely right, but never in doubt. So I, I have an opinion about everything, and I, I love to share it, even when it's not necessarily wanted. Um, and what I want to do today is, is talk a little bit about the transformation that's gone on in the consumer space and how we should be thinking about applying it to what's happening in the enterprise, right? How uh, companies that sell to each other, how companies that sell industrial equipment and, and non-consumer products, what lessons should we be taking from these enormous transformations? Because the fact is consumers are leading the way. Now, that wasn't always true, right? Uh, there was a time, right? Many of you know IBM for our, our great early products, punch cards, typewriters. But there was a time when other companies disrupted IBM. And those companies were companies like Wang, which wanted to sell uh, automated word processors. And frankly, it was, they actually made a better product than we did, right? Enterprises used to disrupt each other a lot before consumers were busy leading the marketplace. And, uh, heaven forbid, now it's true, IBM has disrupted, IBM has been disrupted many times. Occasionally, we succeed in disrupting other companies. We did it a long time ago. We disrupted Apple. We changed the game in the personal computing business. And uh, we are, uh, by the way, I want a really hat tip to JD, uh, because we are, at IBM, we are so proud of what Lenovo has done with our business. And we are, um, we're proud of our small contribution and the success that you guys have had doing what we couldn't, which is kicking HP over and over again. <laughs> um, I also really congratulate you for, for giving a case study about failure. Right? Now, I can't do that because we have too many to choose from at IBM. <laughs> but uh, I think uh, we learn a lot from our mistakes. And I also want to learn a lot from what's going on in the consumer space and apply it to the enterprise environment. So uh, lately, it's consumers that have been driving all of this transformation. And uh, I'm not going to go into the details, but consumers, what consumers have been doing is they've been taking things that used to be products, discrete items, and they've been wrapping them all together. They don't really think about an iPhone as a piece of hardware that comes with an operating system. It's an integrated product. Right? Android is a service that includes Gmail and Maps and all other kinds of Google services Right, in many cases. Not always, but in many cases. Right? All of these things have been wrapped together in something that we have been calling this transition from products to services. Right? And this transition has had an enormous impact. Now, I grant you, 
I'm going to show you a chart here, and this is not a Horus chart. It doesn't animate, okay, uh, and um, it, it's not quite as good, but this is a snapshot of the consumer, uh, global consumer electronics market in 2001. And here's this market in 2011, exactly 10 years later. Over the course of 10 years, this is my innovation, over the course of 10 years, Apple went from being worth about $7 billion to being worth more than the entire Japanese and Korean consumer electronics industries combined by market capitalization. Right? And this, was, this is looking back just to 2011. Things have obviously gone substantially further since then. Right? So clearly in the consumer space, an enormous transition has happened. Right? We've gone from products to services, and in the course of that happening, it's created a set of winners and losers. Right? This industry has been completely turned over. The same thing cannot be said in the enterprise space. Right? So whether it's software services, or um, power systems, or jet engines, for the most part, business-to-business -business products aren't being transformed at anything like the same rate. And what I'd like to do today is talk about a couple of things. First of all, give you a few examples of, of the market itself. Secondly, talk about what are the obstacles? Why is it that B2B transactions haven't gone through this radical transformation? Right? And also share with you my view that, in fact, these transformations are uh, accelerating, that the barriers that have slowed down transformation in the enterprise space are starting to crumble. Right. And when that happens, the transformation will be every bit as fast in the enterprise space as it was in the consumer space. So let me give you, let me give you a, sort of a, a kind of an equivalent chart here. This is in enterprise software. Right? So uh, if we just set this up, and it's a simplification, I grant you. But if you think about companies like SAP and Oracle, they sell traditional enterprise software. Right? You pay for a license, you get a piece of software. There are other companies that sell entirely an online service, like NetSuite, Workday, and Salesforce.com. Today, the stock market thinks that all three of those companies are worth less than half of, say, SAP, right? and a tiny fraction of what SAP and Oracle are worth. Right? So what the market says, what the stock market says is, we don't think this transformation has happened. And I would argue that this is a little bit like Apple in 2001. Right? Everybody looks at this and says, transformation hasn't happened yet. These companies are just not that valuable. Right? And I would argue, in fact, that this transformation is coming, is coming very, very quickly in a whole range of enterprise and B2B segments. So how, how do we know that this transformation is, is not here yet? Well, uh, it's not here yet. I mean, you look, the stock market says it's not here. But it's also not here if you go and talk to some of uh, IBM's big clients. Right, so this is one, this is one of my favorites. They are a big B2B seller. They sell power and automation equipment. Right, big transformers, industrial equipment. And I asked them three questions. I said, first of all, what portion of your devices can actually be connected to the internet and managed remotely? Right, and their answer was about half of our devices. Right, and, uh, but of the devices that uh, can be connected, or actually they said two-thirds maybe, the devices that can be connected, only about a third are actually connected. The second question I asked is, what do you do with this data? All this data is flowing in from these connected devices. Turns out the answer is pretty much nothing. Right? I asked them, I said, do you use it to predict when the product will break down? Do you use it to forecast how much maintenance they need? Their answer was no. We just gather some data on it. Right? Statistics, it's interesting. And then I asked them finally, I said, how do you sell this stuff? Do you sell it as a solution? Right? Do you sell it as a service? Or do you sell it as, here's the product, and now if it breaks, I'll sell you a service contract or a spare part? And their answer was the latter. It's a product, right? and if it breaks, we sell you a service contract or some spare parts. So the stock market says B2B companies haven't transformed from products to connected services. And our clients say the same thing. They're not selling connected services. They're just selling products today. Now, why is that? I will argue 
that it, 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 if you sit down with your, our clients, that what they'll tell you is, you know, B2B is different. It's different than B2C, right, for a whole bunch of reasons. And my own experience is that although those reasons are true today, they are changing quickly. So let me zero in on, on a couple one of those things. So first of all, uh, why is it that B2B isn't the same as B2C? And I always hear three answers. First of all, it's the relationship is driving the sale, right? We've been playing golf together for 10 years, right? You always ask about my kids, right? You know all about my business, right? That's a, a big part of it. The second thing that we often hear is we have a huge installed base, right? There are billions of dollars, millions of devices of all kinds out there in the industrial world, right? When we, when, you know, when we switch on the lights, there are thousands of devices, transformers, switches, substations, right? And they're not installed for one year or two years. They don't depreciate in six months. They're here for 10, 20, 30, 50 years, right? So that installed base means that I can't just sever my relationship with a B2B supplier easily, right? And that installed base is what drives most of the revenue and profit in many of these companies. By the way, in, my, in the past life, I was, a, I was a consultant with McKinsey and Company, and one of my first engagements was an aircraft manufacturer. And um, at that, that time, the aircraft company, they made more than 100% of their annual profits with spare parts. And do you know what our first recommendation was? Raise the price of spare parts. <laughs> and then lastly, uh, what clients will tell you is buying a B2B technology, whether it's a transformer or a factory automation system or a photocopier, is much more complicated than buying a cell phone. And so consequently, you can't just switch easily, right? There's a lot of knowledge and, and, and intelligence that goes into that, right? So it's really hard for these transitions to take place. And if they're going to take place at all, it's going to happen very slowly. Now, there's big elements of truth in all three of these statements. But they're not as powerful and as sort of irrefutable as you might believe. I, I think that very significant portions of our industry are going to be transformed over the coming years. And let me go a little bit into why. Unless somebody wants to stop me here and tell me I'm completely wrong. OK, it's good. So first of all, relationships, right? I would argue that social networking is commoditizing relationships, right? Relationships, in fact, mostly belong to people. I am friends with Bruce. I am friends with JD. And uh, relationships go with the salesperson. And salespeople can be paid. They can change jobs, right? And thanks to the miracle of services like LinkedIn, Right? When I change jobs, it takes me two clicks to announce that to thousands of people. Right? In fact, what that means is that sales relationships are easier to move around. Right? And social networks have made it easier to grab somebody with a big network and move them to a new company in the market. Right? There, there are salespeople right now who are going from established players to new ones. And when they do that, with two clicks of a button, they're taking their entire Rolodex with them. And there's nothing that can stop that from happening. Right? Secondly, analytics and online marketplaces are, in any case, reducing the power of the relationship sale. Okay? When you sell a product that can be analyzed and managed, that means we can determine, in a fairly objective way, which product is actually better. Right? You can manage and, and support those products, and you can conduct a very transparent online purchasing process. And the result is that no matter how much Bruce may like me, because I always lose when we play golf. I am, by the way, a terrible golf player. Just awful. Uh, and actually, clients like that. They like to win when you play golf with them. But no matter how much I lose at golf, it doesn't change the fact that if I don't have a competitive product, it's going to show up in these very transparent online marketplaces. Another thing that's happening is the value of the installed base is going down. Right? So at IBM, we spend a lot of time thinking about China. Uh, China is a very, very important market to us. And in fact, all of our senior executives spend a tremendous amount of time in China. Uh, last uh, quarter, I visited China six times in 12 weeks. 
I cannot emphasize enough how important China is as a source of growth, right? But China doesn't have the same long-held installed base that the US and Europe does, right? In China, it's about new production, right? New facilities, new infrastructure. And by 2025, China will be the largest market in the world. So when you sit there and tell me that your big installed base in Europe, US and Europe is, is very valuable, I'm not always certain that that's really going to survive, your, that's going to make the difference for your company. JD pointed this out. China is the market where enterprises compete. Right? And by the way, this client that I had many years ago at McKinsey, um, when we told them to raise the prices of spare parts, they did. And it substantially helped their profits, but in the end, it did not save them because they could not win any new aircraft orders. Right? At the end of the day, installed base may generate a lot of profit. It will not determine your survival. Secondly, uh, the economics of manufacturing are changing. Right? One of the reasons why the installed base is powerful and important is industrial products are complex and they're often made in relatively small volumes. Right? And spare parts are hard to come by. How many spare parts does Alcatel have for a railroad switch that was made in 1950 and installed somewhere in rural France? Not many. Right? Now, what's changing is in the past, if that device broke down or you needed to replace it, there were a limited number of places to get spare parts, and they were very expensive. Today, I can make a scan of that spare part, and I can print it on my own with a 3D printer. Right? And what we are seeing here is the companies are actually telling their clients, print your own spare parts. You can download schematics for spare parts. And so we believe, over the coming few years, that power of that, in, that long installed base is going to diminish for this reason as well. Uh, it'll be very easy to build and manufacture low volume replacements or spares or, or new devices. <coughs> Lastly, we think that uh, when you shift from selling a product to a service, you transform the economics. And I've got here an example from the, the business of uh, photocopying. Right? So many years ago, by many years ago, I mean like three years ago. Uh, two, how, how many, three iPhones ago. Uh, a long, long time ago, companies sold photocopiers. And then you bought toner and paper and service. Right? And by the way, they installed these copiers all over the place. And after that, they basically had no idea what you did with them. Today, you don't buy a copier if you're a large enterprise. You buy pages of service, okay? And the company that installs these devices is responsible for maintaining them, for managing them, for making sure that there's toner and service and, 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 and uh, uh, paper and everything in them, right? And they connect all of these devices to the internet and they manage them. And so they know which devices get used, which ones don't, which ones break down, uh, uh, how to make sure that they're available, and uh, how many devices to actually have. And it turns out, that they take something that's very complex, right? How many printers should I have? Uh, how much toner should I buy? How much should I be paying for service? And they boil it down to a very simple number, which is this is how many cents you should pay per page copied or printed. They take something complex, they make it simple, and at the same time, they use all this data about how you're using the product and where you're using it to substantially reduce the price. So our friends at a company called Fortiza, they do analysis. They showed that across about 110 companies, the average company that shifted from buying a product to a service, when they shifted it, they saved about 30% of their costs. 30% right? in cost savings right, is a very easy decision. Right? Depending on how much money you're spending, you, know, you can make a quick, you, you can take what was a complicated decision and make it very simple. Yes, I'm going to switch to this service. So uh, if we think back to the, this uh, discussion, right, uh, relationships that used to be powerful and enduring have become less important. Right? Transparency has come to the procurement process, right? uh, and it's, uh, the value of the installed base has declined. And now on top of that, uh, you can take something that was complicated and make a very, you know, parts and labor and service and devices and turn it into a very simple 
a price per page, price per flight hour, price per, per unit of measure, right? You can make, make a complex product into a simple service, right? When that happens, you have rapid, dramatic transformation, right? And I love this picture because I think this picture shows nicely what happens when large enterprises try to make really aggressive turns. <laughs> Things tend to fall apart a bit. But that is exactly what uh, many enterprises are at risk of facing, right? And I, I want to share with you with this picture with you because this particular one shows what happens in the printing and copying business when the market went from products to services. So for years, people who had been saying, hey, you should just buy pages of output. Up until about 2007, basically everybody said, that's great, but not interested. But about 2007, they really got the connected value proposition right. And they were able to start saying things like, I'll guarantee you 30% cost reduction. And when that happened in the course of three years, the whole market, the majority of the market shifted from buying devices and toner and service to buying copying and printing as a service. So three years, the majority of the market transformed. Okay? Now, that doesn't look so different than the kind of picture we might see in a, a consumer electronics business. And I know it's not so different because I stole one of Horace's pictures. Um, this is the profit share in the consumer, in the phone business, over the last three years, from 2000, four years, from 2007 to 2011. So you can see that in the space of about four years, we shifted from a uh, market driven by Nokia to one driven by Apple. Complete dramatic market share shift in four years. That doesn't look that different than what happened in the printing and copying business. Right? The market shifted from product to service in just three years. Right. And by the way, in a way that is very similar to consumer electronics, this seems to be a winner-take-all business. So in the consumer electronics business, something like 99% of all the mobile phone profits, and Horace will correct me when I'm wrong, go to Apple and Samsung. Um, now, if you do cloud hosting of websites, 96% of that market goes to the top three providers. 74% of the market for cellular infrastructure goes to the top three players, right? And 52% of the printing and copying market go to the top three players. So these markets, when they transform, they don't just change what's being sold, they, change, they produce winners and losers, right? And overwhelmingly, they drive significant consolidation of the market. And a good example here is the printing and copying business. It's been undergoing pretty dramatic transformation I, I grant you, if you can read this, you don't need glasses. Um, in fact, nobody should be able to read it. But my point is, you can really see this market has been thinning out for decades, but as it's accelerated recently, right? And at the same time, as lots of companies are going out of business, this whole new ecosystem of application service providers has been created, right? So it's not just companies like Apple that need app ecosystems. Even companies that make printers and copiers need ecosystems of service companies, of systems managers, of software developers. Almost every type of industry, as it moves from being a product to a service, needs to develop and create its own ecosystem to support that. OK, so I've talked about uh, where enterprises have lagged in transformation. I've talked about why I think, in some key areas, uh, enterprise B2B sales are headed for transformation. Now let me try to talk about how we can prepare for the future. Because the truth is, no matter how good your analytics are, you cannot predict the future. But I would argue that you can at least try to prepare to some degree for it. So I think, in, in my experience, there's three critical conclusions that we can draw from when markets shift from products to services in the B2B space. First of all, it's driven by the business case, right? When the business case becomes crystal clear, when it becomes absolutely obvious that you can make dramatic savings, that drives immediate uh, transformation, right? 20, 30, 40% savings, that makes the decision easy, right? Secondly, when the transformation starts, 
It moves quickly. It moves as fast in consumer products as it does, uh, it moves as fast as you might expect it to in consumer products, right? So no matter how great your relationship, no matter how many times you lose to the customer playing golf, right? When this industry transformation starts, it's going to move quickly. And then lastly, these connected products and services markets are, in general, winner-take-all markets. Right? So we can't easily assume that just because we've been coasting along at 10% market share, that that's going to continue. Right? The odds are that the company that cracks the code on how to do this well, they're going to take their share of the market from whatever it is, 10, 20, 30%, to so maybe something closer to 50 or 60%. And everybody else will struggle for kind of the, the what's left. So, uh, and, and by the way, you know, disruptive competitors do a great job of figuring out how this transformation might happen, right? And it's because they see the market in different ways, right? Amazon looks at the market. They don't think they're a retailer. I think in many ways they think of themselves as kind of a technology company, right? Uh, another example I really like is, is the U.S. Is, is in the U.S. is called Square. So Square enables you to buy stuff with your credit card through your mobile phone. But they don't think of themselves as a credit card company or as a transaction processor, right? They think of themselves as a company that gathers and sells consumer insight. Now, turn that around. American Express thinks of themselves as a credit card company, right? And they get paid every time you swipe the card. So for them, what they sell are transactions. And you know, marketing data is a little extra on the side for them. If you're square, what they sell is marketing insight, and the cost of transactions is something they give away. You should be scared when somebody starts to think of your business as something that they give away. Right? I will be very worried the day that somebody decides that consulting is something that we should give away. Right? And I would actually really appreciate it if Horace would start charging for access to his website. Uh, and then uh, the last one is free. Uh, Free is a great company in France. They took uh, an IPTV set-top business and said, you know, we have millions of set-top boxes in homes around the country, right? And all of them have Wi-Fi. Maybe we could use that to build a mobile network. Since most people make their calls at home, right, or at the office where they have Wi-Fi and it's usually free, we can literally charge nothing for the entry level. Right? And they have completely disrupted the market in France for mobile phones because they looked at the market from an enti entirely different space. Now, how do you do that? Right? So take an example, something like a, a numerical controlled machine tool. Right? Now, how you look at the product and how your customer looks at the product may be completely different. Right? You think of it as uh, you know, your product. But your customer could look at it a bunch of different ways. They could say, wow, this thing is really expensive to own and operate, right? And I wish I didn't have to own it, right? Or they may look at it differently. They say, you know, our ability to use these tools is a critical differentiator, and I need to control it, and I must have it, right? Or they could look at it entirely differently and they say, you know what? This piece of my production process is a weak link, right? Every time it goes down, I lose millions of dollars. Right? So if you can understand how your client sees your product, then you can figure out how to change the value proposition. Right? If your clients, what they care about is uptime. They want 100% uptime. We heard from TSMC this morning. 100% uptime is worth millions of dollars. So if that's so important, maybe you should be selling uptime, not machine tools. Right? If it's, uh, you know, failure risk or uh, com if it's commodity, maybe you should be selling cost per unit of output and helping your client manage down their cost. But figuring out this way to change your perspective on the product, I believe, is one of the key skills in managing this transition from selling a product to a service. Right? And by the way, I believe you need to do that before the market transition happens. I was reading a great article by Clayton Christensen about uh, the transitions that's happened in the newspaper business. And uh, he talks a lot about the fact that in the newspapers, a lot of them thought, hey, business is great. And they kept thinking that businesses was OK right up until it wasn't. But by the time the business was really collapsing, it was too late to make dramatic changes to their value proposition and their approach. 
So in this, that same re respect, we have to anticipate the transformation of our markets before it actually occurs. Uh, how do you anticipate that? I believe you do it from what I would call an outside-in perspective. Right? Some of the biggest transitions have occurred entirely driven by the sales force. The truth is that when IBM got into the services business, we did not really know that much what we were doing. Okay? What we knew was that our clients wanted to get out of the data business. They wanted to get out of the data center business. They wanted to stop having to hire and manage all of these people. And so we said, we'll take them. Right? Uh, IBM salespeople said, we'll take them. Right? And they, they went forward. And, and the truth is that they were selling this vision and meeting the customer's need before finance and supply chain and the service organization were really ready to follow. Right? But they started with the customer need, and they kind of tried to line up the organization as quickly as they could behind that. And truth be told, that's exactly what Xerox did in the uh, printing and copying business. They didn't start from the, the, the inside out and say, hey, we need to redesign our whole value chain. They said, we got a customers who are asking for a different value proposition. We need to start selling it that way. Right? And they had to actually work backwards and say, OK, now I'm selling all these contracts. How do I really change my business operating model? Right? It was an outside-in process. And truth be told, it's pretty messy. Right? It doesn't look very elegant or strategic. It doesn't fit nicely on a slide. You know, IBM lost a lot of money on bad contracts that we signed right? because we didn't fully understand, as we were getting into this business, all the responsibilities that came with it. Right? But in the end, it turned out to be a very smart move for us. So, I want to finish with just one thought, which is, you know, above all else, right, it, you know, IBM, as I mentioned at the beginning, I can't tell you many stories about failure because we have too many to choose from, right? We've been disrupted more than we've disrupted anybody else, right? And the strange thing is, we're still around, right? I mean, I could give you an incredible list of businesses that IBM has screwed up. The very first smartphone was made by IBM. I guess we didn't stick, stick to it, right? The first PCs, uh, you know, the first laptops, right? We, we developed those, right? Uh, relational databases, I mean, I could go on, right? We are great at coming up with businesses and then letting other companies figure out how to make money from them, right? So how is it that IBM has survived? And, and a couple years ago, we celebrated our 100th anniversary, and uh, a lot of smart journalists and historians looked at the long history of IBM and they said, what is it about IBM that has caused it to survive so many mistakes? And the answer is customer focus, right? Long before we had a services business, we were focused and crazy about service, right? And even to this day, we spend all of our time obsessing and thinking about what is it our clients need, right? I spend more time thinking about how you try to run your business than I sometimes spend in thinking about how to run mine. Right? We're focused on optimizing your business. Uh, and as a result, we spend a lot of time having this discussion. What do our clients need? How will they manage transformation? And I think that that is the only sort of enduring protection in an era of substantial transformation. So with that, uh, I do want to acknowledge our, our friends at Fotiza who shared a lot of terrific data with us around the transformation of the B2B space. And I want to conclude by, uh, as, uh, as was done yesterday, by posing the question to you. What is holding back the transformation of your own industry segment, right? And how far have you seen some of these trends, like the commoditization of relationships or the ability to connect and transform products into services, take in your business? So, questions, comments, complaints? Um, you're talking about from product transform to services. Now, I, I just got back from, uh, from San Francisco with Salesforce. They're showing a lot of case study in terms of how a business is using social to become a service platform. What's your take on that? Because in US, I can see that happening. But also in Asia, I see that some challenges there. Just want to see uh, what you think about that. Second question, if I can. <laughs> uh, the, in terms of consumer behavior um, for B2B, what, what are the key substance that, that you think uh, is, is relevant? Uh, what I'm trying to say is a lot of B2Bs, they, they handle it with a lot of vendors. But now you want to turn it into service. Now we're talking about B2C. So all of a sudden, that substance is a little different. And how do we find that balance? Thank you. 
Okay, so two, two difficult questions. The first one I would say is, um, you know, in terms of social, yes, it's, it's got, had a big impact in the US and Europe. My view is it's having a huge impact in China, right? Uh, you know, you can see I've got my Sina Weibo ID. I don't have many followers, so anybody who wants to follow me on Sina Weibo, please. Uh, it's a little competition inside of IBM as to who has the most, and I'm losing right now. Um, but in China, social media is incredibly powerful, right? And so uh, we, you know, in Africa too, so for example, in, um, in Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, Facebook has a program where if you sign up for Facebook, they will give you airtime credits and they will, um, they will kind of not charge you for data usage to access a basic version of Facebook. And we see tremendous Facebook usage in Sub-Saharan Africa. There's basically nowhere on earth that isn't, you know, where, where social component isn't very huge. And it's huge in the B2B space as well. I mean, one of the things that's driving Salesforce.com is the social discussion that goes on on LinkedIn, right? Like, I'm on Salesforce, are you on Salesforce? What do you think of Salesforce? Why did you switch from something else, right? Um, you know, if you look at, uh, you know, what, how these things spread, they spread in a way that is remarkably consumer-like, right? In fact, we, Ginny Rometty, our CEO, talks about how we need to work on making IBM more consumable, right? Uh, I don't think there are many products from IBM today that you can go to our website, whip out your credit card, and start paying for. But that's where we need to get to. Even we have to take all of this enterprise complexity, right? And we have to make it incredibly simple. And it's very challenging, but I think that's the bar that's being set by services like Salesforce.com. Taking tremendous complexity, they're making it incredibly simple, and it's spreading through the enterprise space just as fast as a consumer product will. JD. So I, I tend to like these crystal ball questions. So it, you, you talk to a lot of customers, uh, great presentation, great example of the copier business kind of moving to this. Uh, what other enterprise businesses are ripe for that transition over the next, say, two to five years? Uh, so great question. You know, I think... Uh, so in, in IBM, and we, I, I at least spend my time focusing on electronics, and we think about it, there are six segments. A semiconductor, uh, power and automation, consumer electronics, network equipment, and medical devices. And um, if I think about where we are, like uh, office equipment, very far down that path, right? Um, I think uh, power and automation is also going to move there in that direction, right? People are going to start to buy tooling and equipment on a services type of basis, right? I think um, far beyond five years, but within the, certainly within an area that we are thinking about and talking a lot to our clients about is medical devices, right? So if you look at the way insurers buy, they really want to buy health, right? They, they want to make you healthy, right? And a lot of the diseases that we treat, the vast majority of diseases that are treated today by healthcare systems are not single interventions, right? You have an infection, you get an antibiotic. They are chronic diseases. You don't get enough exercise. You have to change your habits, right? Those things are best managed as ongoing services. So we think even medical devices will be uh, transformed pretty quickly. Well, thanks. Thank you, Bruce.